Great. So welcome to the Rhythmic Space Artist Talk. Um, this morning, my name is Misa. Today here with us, we have Rodam Amazur, I hope I'm reading the name right, and Gus Hoffman. Um, so I'm just going to introduce a little bit about the artists that um, we're uh, kind of doing this exhibition with just a little bit. Um, so Gus grew up in um, Arizona and he went to Bard College for his undergraduate degree. Um, he's taken classes at the Art Students League in New York City, um, where he studied with Mary Beth McKenzie, William Scharf, um, Ephraim Rubenstein. He also attended PAFA in Philadelphia, where he studied with Scott Noel. Um, he's received his MFA from PAFA and he moved to New Orleans, where he currently um, works, shows his work. Um, he's also part of um, the gallery called The Front, which I also had the pleasure of exhibiting with them. Um, so that's where he is currently. Um, and we also have Rodam Amzer, who was born in New York and currently lives and works in Israel. She graduated from the Jerusalem Studio School Master Class in 2013. In 2009 and 2010, she participated in the Italy Master Class Program instructed by Israel Hertzberg, Stuart Schills, and Ken Cooley, who's with us today. Um, she has taught painting and collage since 2014 and has given numerous workshops in Israel and the US. Um, she's also represented by Rothschild Fine Art Gallery, Tel Aviv. Um, she has received the Henry, I, Henryon Award for from painting from the Hampstead Art Society in London. And her work is part of the permanent collection at the Israel Presidential Residency and private collections around the world. So um, it's, been, it's a great honor to do a show with them. This is just an online exhibition and it's, it's not an in-person show, but um, I titled the exhibition Rhythmic, Sp Rhythmic Space. Um, I'm very drawn to both of the works, having this really playful um, way of engaging the space that are happening kind of in daily life. Like that's kind of the depiction of these images that are just like every day, but the way that they're kind of playing with the space in which these motifs, subjects, or even figures exist in is, is very exciting to kind of, it feels like a dance. Um, so when, when I saw their work, I just wanted to put them together and kind of have this really um, playful way of thinking about how can we engage with our space in the way that we um, put down the colors or we, we engage with paint or even shapes, um, color shapes. So um, it was really exciting to be able to put together the show. Um, and before we start the actual artist talk, I thought it would be a great idea to kind of do a walkthrough of the gallery um, of the online, uh, the virtual show. So with that said, we'll just um, look at the exhibition together and then we'll go into kind of a brief time where each artist will talk about their influences and how their works have been informed by those um, influences. And then we'll dive into a conversation. Um, so if you have any questions, we have a Q&A at the end. So if you can wait a little bit until the end, that'll be great. So with that said, I'm just gonna get started. There will be audio, like kind of a music that I'll play with it. And you're feel free to mute the music or like mute the microphone or uh, whatever that's coming through the computer if you don't want kind of the distraction of the music. So um, here I'm just going to share the screen. Thank you for your patience. I'm still uh, navigating Zoom. It's kind of an interesting situation. So. Yeah. 
the second part of the music is not intended. <laughs> but um, I just want to quickly point out that um, there will be works that are titled um, shown underneath individual names that the artist is showing here. So if you um, and also like if you click on the name, it will lead you to their website. Um, and also, if you scroll down far enough, there is a guest book that you can sign. So it's kind of similar to how you would um, if you go to an actual physical gallery, you can leave your name here and leave them a message and we will receive it. And at the end of the exhibition, we'll share those comments with the artists. So feel free to engage with the website and uh, leave them comments. And if you want to stay in touch, you can also subscribe um, to our newsletter and um, content. So um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and you should see me. So, um, so that was kind of a funky way of <laughs> incorporating music. I'm still trying different things. Um, and I hope, you know, Gus and Rotom, you guys enjoyed the way that it's being put together. And I'm also curious to hear how you kind of see your work now that it's being placed in conversation with one another's work. I know this might be the first time that you're actually meeting each other. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about that before jumping into sharing your individual presentation, that'll be awesome. Whoever want to start first. <laughs> um, I think you did a great job putting our images back to back. It was really um, great to, to sort of go back and forth between the two of our work and to see connections that I hadn't seen before. Um, I really appreciated that. And Rotom, I really enjoyed seeing. I, I've seen a lot of your work. I followed you on Instagram, but um, seeing even more of it today was uh, very special. Yeah, I also felt how um, how just to see it back to back um, and 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 to see like how how each of us are asking sometimes different questions, sometimes similar questions. It's like, it was really like a dance. Yeah, and also uh, Misa, I just, I love the title for the show, the idea of rhythmic space. Um, it's something I, I guess I've never put it that way before, but I think that's something I think about constantly in my painting is the idea of sort of building up a sense of rhythm or repetition, sort of to find a structure and then also to kind of, once you get enough structure to sort of allow it to disintegrate a little bit and then build it yeah. back up. Um, and uh, I think that's a beautiful way to put it in painting. Yeah, and also what you did with the music, which is basically <laughs> like the music turns to, like it's you. Um, it's like your choice. And then that's like your, your, you kind of make the space with, with your choice of music and you, um, it kind of, it gives it that a certain atmosphere like, um, and that, that was really wonderful as well. Yeah, it's a it's definitely kind of an unusual choice of music um, because I think people tend to pair maybe more or less like I think jazz is kind of colorful even out of like the instrumental side of music but having lyrics and having something more poppy um, the drum the drums are like kind of creating that rolling feeling of like just that hopping, you know, jumping yeah. from one another. And I feel that when I see both of your work, um, I think collage is a very shape-driven process. Whereas like painting, not always. I mean, painting, we're still creating form, but the way that Gus, you're using these colors, it's it's kind of, um, it, it feels like they're kind of pulsing out of that background or, you know, the space, we tend to distinguish space between ourselves and the environment, but the way that you're incorporating space to be part of almost like as alive as the subject or as the motif, such as like still life or people, um, I think that's kind of um, more or less how I experience your work, which is like, there's no this discrimination towards like things that are, we normally see as lesser, which is kind of the space in which the things that it inhabit. Um, so I just thought it would be really fun to see how we can create a new way of interpreting works when we put them together and kind of insert ourselves into that conversation. Um, so enough about the curation side of things. Um, we want to hear about your process. So I've asked each artist to kind of 
maybe find works or people that have influenced them and how that affects the way that they create work and think about um, seeing, think about the visual approach. So um, Rotem, do you mind starting first? Maybe you wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. We would have slides, so we'll have some images to go with that too. Okay, great. Um... Awesome. Um, does everyone see my slideshow? Yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yeah, I brought, um, I brought three influences that, um, like that really changed the way I see painting and, um, basically led me to how I work today. And, um, um, and yeah, I, I, I'll start with the first one, which is, uh, Giotto. Um, and uh, in Giotto, I met, um, he's, he's a like early Renaissance painter. And I, my first meeting with him was um, live. Like I didn't know his work before, before I saw it in Italy um, in 2009 in a, in a small church in Assisi. And when I went into the church, like I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk about just like how it was kind of how like the setup, it, you go into the church and there's like these two columns of, of paintings, um, really huge, like eight, eight by eight or nine by nine feet, maybe even bigger. Um, and they're like above your head, um, one after another, like these squares, like this, this square is just one of, of many. And they're, they're telling the story of uh, St. Francis. Um, and, and I was, it was the first time that I, um, that I was with a sketchbook while looking at, 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 at art, basically. So I was really like experiencing Giotto with, um, with my hand, like with my body. And, and what I realized, like when I, when I was in front of, of Giotto was like, basically that like, he's, he's really just excited of, of like about, about squares or about, um, or about like, colors or about you know he's he he's he's basically playing so like I I in that same day it was it was like um it was a pretty like ecstatic experience for me because I I was really I really felt he was there like I felt like oh now he's playing like you can see here it's like there's like a game of squares okay now I'll do a drawing of of like all the squares or like now I'll do the draw now I'll do a drawing of all the yellows or now I'll do a drawing of like all the circles that are making like a certain kind of music or so like I kind of I understood that he's dealing with like different motifs on on like kind of like a like like music that he's like he's dealing with different um just like asking himself different questions and um yeah and that that like that experience um of just meeting like meeting a painter that lived so much time, you know, like before me, but, but I really felt him alive and there with me in the room. Um, that just kind of, that just changed the way I really looked at masters or, or any painting that's not mine from then on um, as something that's kind of like alive and, and moving and that like I can deconstruct basically any um, like, any painting I love to like to, to really to, with, with drawing, of course, like to really understand what interests the painter and then to understand what interests me. And basically what happened was that I came, I came home with the drawings um, and, and then I made these collages from memory um, and from the drawings. So it's like a, a series of, of 30 collages about this big. Um, and, um, and yeah, that, that, it felt like everything kind of started for me there. Um, and uh, my second, the second artist I want to talk about is uh, Ken Culey, um, which is, he's here today also. And maybe some of you know him. He's, um, he's a dear friend and teacher. And uh, for me, like, the, just like to, 
to meet him and to to see his approach um, to art and to life uh, really like just changed changed the way I changed the way I saw I saw painting and saw like and 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 how I how I came like it, it just changed everything it changed my life um, so here I brought um, a painting that he did in um, in Italy in 2009. So, so like Misa said, there was a, I, I studied at the Jerusalem Studio School and Ken was a guest artist in Italy. And, um, and, and yeah, so everyone was of course painting the landscape, like trees and hills and, um, you know, the Italian beautiful landscape. And Ken was sitting um, in front of this, uh, this junkyard of like the, it was it was a small village so it was like kind of all this old barn um like barn things like uh, uh like I remember there was like a, a like a blue plow and like a rusty like rusty shovels and like this green uh kind of this greenish tractor and just like a pile of things and he was um so he it like just so he was working on these like wooden panels um, and and he made he he had a lot of wooden panels the same size and he started many of them sitting in front of this of this pile like of this chaos um, and what I what I understood like later on and and seeing him but like also after reading his notes um, many times is that like what he was doing was like was actually putting information and putting shapes and colors that he was seeing um, from nature to the painting and kind of and making a situation um, in the painting that was that was um, pretty like pretty chaotic um, to just to put more and more shapes and and not to say like okay I'll, I'll solve the the composition by having like two or three shapes so he's putting many, many shapes, and then, and then he's bringing the brain to like a place where, where like, where basically only instinct can 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 find like only instinct can help you find your way out of chaos, <laughs> um, and and these and so in the end, like in the end of these few weeks, he had these beautiful compositions of like, of like, of this pile, but every composition was a totally different composition and every composition was a total surprise, I think. Um, and and he, he gave himself like really specific limitations. So like the colors, he was taking the colors from nature. Of course, he was also inventing colors, but like the colors were pretty much this color combination and then the shapes. So he was taking the shapes, but he was like playing around with them each time. And the format was also the same. So he he had like certain limitations, but then like that brought him to, um, to to that gave him like the security I think um, to really come to to a feeling of like chaos and then to find the harmony out of that. Um, and that's really like I I learned so much, and that's like just like to limit yourself in certain things and then and then to find how you break through, like how instinct. Like how the thinking mind just can't get you out of it, and only instinct can. Um, so that's um, just a story. <laughs> um, and and then in 2010, I I also there was like I I also found like a small shed <laughs> and did my take on on painting in front of chaos. Um, and um, the the third um, influence is um, is George Brack. And um, so he, I think what I really learned from Brock is, um, is, is how he uses like identifiable objects um, to like really um, like to take the abstraction further. So like, so he has many, many still lifes and all the still lifes, it's like, you really see that he's using like a fish uh, like a pot, a lemon, it's it's like very clear and simple objects. But then like, because he's using these simple objects, so he can, so it's like, we're like, okay, we're familiar with these objects. 
Ooh, like it's kind of like a feeling of security. And then he's like, okay, now let's go for like a ride. And then he takes us to, he just, he starts really um, abstracting things. And, and I think like, he also talks about this in his writings that, that he's really interested in like what happens between the objects. Um, so like here you can see how, so, so he's turning like the pot, it, like the, the picture into like um, this like king that he's like, hmm, hello. Um, like he's, he's kind of giving him like this, this human quality of like with like his nose up. And then the fish are like, are like, I don't know, you know, they like two, two, two servants or two, I don't know, two <laughs> small people like, hi. <laughs> and then the lemon is, is also kind of jiggly and has this kind of human quality. So, and then the lemon is also talking with like the pattern in the back. And, um, and then the fish is also talking with like this, this part here, like the opening, uh, which is also talking with the pattern. So he's like, so he's, and then the play, you know, is talking also with like the picture and the table. So he's like, he's really, he's really playing abstract games, but like with um, these, these very like earth, uh, like he's putting us down to earth. <laughs> Not he, like it's, he's grounding us, I can say with familiarity. Um, and yeah, and then I, I did these um, like a series of, um, 10, about 10 still lives that uh, also Misa showed a few um, in 2014. And they're all kind of my, me communicating to Brock um, in, in a way, like they all are, are kind of a conversation with Brock and um, yeah. And, um, and yeah. And I think like invention and invention and observation is something that I really take with me um throughout everything I I do like I think that borderline is really interesting like where where does invention start where does observation finish like finish or start or and 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 just to play with that um so yeah so <laughs> on to so on to you guys <laughs> or thank you oh I'll stop sharing sorry Amazing. That was, uh, that was great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will, I will share my screen now. Um, let's do this. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to start, um, back in maybe 2010 or 11. I think it's probably 2010. I was taking um, art classes at the Art Students League, and uh, I was living in New York, and I was very obsessed with a certain type of sort of naturalistic rendering in painting and drawing, which was very modeled um, and sort of very classical in a sense. And I would spend a lot of time going to MoMA and sort of, you know, going and looking at my favorite paintings, and this was not one of my favorite paintings at the time. This was a painting that I would pass every time I would go to the fifth floor of MoMA. Um, and even at the time, it, it had this weird, it kind of captivated me, it kind of held me in not a way that I particularly liked, but um, a way that uh, it made me feel a little uneasy. Like, I think that I would, I would look at this painting and there's so much going on and all the figures in this painting sort of feel frozen in time in a very strange way. Um, and like, for example, the way this woman here uh, in the black hat with the, the orange red stripes on it, the way that curves and sort of those curves are talking to the storefront behind her. And then the way her hand is coming down and it feels like it's actually touching the cab of the woman in front of her. Mm -hmm. um, or the way you have this, this guy here in this white, like, I guess he's like, he looks like he's a construction worker, but he looks like he's actually a milkman. Like, I don't know what he's moving. And he's sort of this conduit to get you to all these other places in the painting. And then this guy here feels so like, like he's a solid form. He's like more solid than a column would be. And I just felt this painting was incredibly weird and I didn't really understand it. And then one day I read the plaque 
And the plaque off to the side was talking about how the surrealists really liked this painting because, you know, it, de it depicted an assault. And I was like, whoa, 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 what assault? What's going on? Like, what are you talking about? This doesn't make any sense. And I looked at this painting, you know, probably a dozen times at this point. And then it, it, I realized that this whole scene over here on the left with this guy grabbing this woman's dress, trying to run away was going on. And I never kind of noticed it. It was just here in the painting. And it's this sort of intense, terrible moment. Um, and I was like, wait, is that, that's going on? How did I not notice this? Um, and that was the first moment in a painting where I felt like an artist. And I know this, especially with this painting, it's a little bit up for debate, but for me, the way I interpret this painting is that it's, it's the street scene, but there's actually something really terrible going on in it. But Balthus, what he did was he kind of hid the terrible thing in plain sight and he made it harder to see. And uh, as a result, he made me as a viewer feel sort of like I was a culprit in it. And that made me feel incredibly strange about the whole experience. Um, that compared to this Goya painting, which is I think about a massacre, which is a terrible, horrible thing to happen. Um, but this painting is set up in sort of the opposite way. This painting is set up to like have you lead you to the tragedy of what's going on in the piece. Um, and in some ways I feel like this Balthus piece is sort of the opposite for me because it's something terrible is going on but it takes you a long time to see it. Um, and when I made that realization about the Balthus piece, it kind of blew my mind, um, not because I wanted to make paintings exactly like this or him, but it made me realize that there was this whole other level of um, talent and interest that could go into painting that was beyond a sort of naturalistic way of looking at figures. And what it really was, was it was, you know, how do you take something that can be really charged and poignant in terms of a subject matter? And then how do you hide it in plain sight in your painting? Um, and then that sort of led me down this route of being like, oh my God, wait, there's this whole other realm to explore in painting that is beyond you know, how well modeled is a hand or how, you know, like how three-dimensional or photographic does something look? Um, and that led me to Bonnard, who, again, for many years I hated, and then for some reason he just kind of opened up to me. Um, and I think Bonnard, I think I, I hated Bonnard for a long time because um, he, I think I saw him as like very bourgeois and like subject matter was just like, you know, like people in the French countryside sort of living this very leisure life and it felt sort of nostalgic to me and I didn't understand it. But once I think I actually started to pay attention to how the paintings were constructed, I realized that I think Bonard is like a very radical painter in the way that he depicts um, everything. I mean, I think that the way he constructs his pieces, um, the thing that I love so much about Bonard, and this is one example, but you can really do it with most of his paintings, is that he gives himself permission to sort of go down every winding avenue that he wants to go down. And that he, he, he's, he's sort of a centralist, like I think he really enjoys everything he's doing. He, he chases every fleeting light, he does everything he wants. But on top of that, he's incredibly ruthless with his compositions and with the relationships of his big shapes. And I think that is just like one of the most amazing feats you can do as a painter. Because I think that for me, that's one of the big struggles is, is how, do you, um, how do you enjoy what you're doing? How do you uh, follow all the details in your work without losing sight of what is the big picture? What, what is the idea to what Misa said, the sort of rhythmic space of what's going on? And that's a really hard challenge to do, but I think Bonard does this really well. Um, he's also a person who just, like, this is a great example of a painting where it's like, I still discover new figures every time I look at it. And so he sort of, he hides these figures in plain sight. And what I think it forces um, you to do is, it, I think it sort of changes your ability to look at paintings, or it does mine, where instead of just, like, I think of, like, it's not, I think a lot of people go to museums and they look at a painting and they look at it and they go, Saw it, good, done, move on. And I think when what his paintings force you to do is like instead of looking at a painting, you sort of watch a painting. And that what it really does is it's he forces you to allow the painting to change in front of you. And he forces you to change your ability to actually perceive what's going on. 
and he makes you slow down and lets the painting kind of open up to you. And I think that that is, um, when I realized that about his work, it was just like a profound gift. Um, okay, another painter that was really important to me is Edwin Dickinson. Um, I went to back to Philadelphia to see the show. They had a retrospective of his work a couple of years ago. Um, and I just wanted to show this painting because I spent a very long time in front of this work. And he is somebody, actually, I think in tandem with what Rodham was saying, talking about Brock, um, I think that he answers the idea of sort of space and how you construct space. I think he's sort of asking the same question as Brock, but doing it in a different way or coming up with a different answer. Um, and the thing that I love, one of the things I love so much about this painting is if you look at this guitar player's hand and then look at this figure, this woman dancing figure off to the right of that, of that hand. And then you realize that I think what I love about his work and moments is that it's not just that he has a sense of space and then he puts something in front of the space. Like I think there's, uh, there's a way that we do that in painting sometimes where you put the background down and you put the middle ground and you put the foreground and then like everything is there. Instead, it's like um, Dickinson has a figure and then the space actually moves around the figure. Like it's not like the space is behind it or around it. It's like everything around this arm is swirling around uh, this guitar player's arm in this really dynamic, interesting, uh, plastic way. And I think I, the only way I, like one of the analogies I think of is it's, it's like a, a rock in a stream with the water kind of moving around it is that everything is interactive and everything is moving back and forth. And there really is this, there's nothing negative about anything in a painting, that everything has its own positive charge. And I think finding that balance in a painting is really, really important to me. Um, okay, I'm almost done with my influences. Uh, I just threw in this Titian painting because I, I think it's one of the most beautiful paintings um, ever made. Um, it, it essentially brought me to tears when I saw it in London for the first time. I, I don't know, I don't know if I want to, um, I don't know what specifically I want to say about it, except that I'm glad Rodham talked about uh, Giotto, because um, I feel like sometimes people don't bring up the old school players a lot. I just felt like I wanted to throw this thing in, because I, I think that Titian is a, a master in so many ways. Uh, okay, now I will move on to my work. So, I'm gonna show you a really old painting first, which is, this is a painting I did of my friend, Tony. Um, and this was going back to when I, um, my first sort of education at the Art Students League. This was um, how I was trying to paint. I think I was trying to paint in a very sort of naturalistic way. I was really into rendering. I mean, I think that I wouldn't have put it this way at the time, because it, it, at the time that would have felt sort of cheap to me, but I think what I was really trying to do was to learn to paint like a camera. Like that's really what I was trying to do. And I think that that's like a great way to start to learn how to paint. I think it's important to learn how to do that to a certain extent. Um, but again, then all these other things happened, all these other artists that I sort of started, um, that I've shown you guys started to inform my work. And one thing I've realized about my own practice is that my taste in art is always two or three years ahead of my ability to do something. So I will become obsessed with an artist or a movement way before I know how to actually do it. And I think what's happening is it's it's understanding that like I'm looking at an artist and I, I know that like I have to grab something from them in my practice and I just don't know how to do it yet. Um, I went to grad school in Philadelphia and I studied with Scott Noel and Scott Noel is a really great painter. Um, and uh, also a shout out to Ken Cooley. I took a workshop with him when I was in uh, PAFA and that was one of the greatest workshops workshops I've ever done. So uh, really opened my, opened my mind. So thank you, Ken, for that. Um, this is uh, a painting I done that I would say is, I would say sort of under the influence of Scott Noel, who I studied with, who is really interested in this inside, inside space, outside space concept of putting figures in front of a door or a window. Um, and I became obsessed with this type of light too. Like I think there's something very magical about painting not just what's outside or what's inside, but both at the same time. And I think that what it does for me is that it forces you to organize everything in your painting in a way that has an inherent structure, but is in a way that is um, 
it sort of simplifies thing, but in a way that I guess you could say is a little more abstract too. Um, also this painting and the next painting that I will show you had this beginning inklings of something that I started to do in my painting that sort of changed everything, which was the addition of the mirror. So in this painting, I have myself in the mirror painting these two models. One's a model and one's another artist painting her actually. Um, and I wasn't planning on having an image of myself in the mirror, but I was sort of bored in the painting. So I put that in and decided to paint myself into the painting. Um, and the exact same thing happened when I was in grad school with this painting. This was the first time I did that, which was, I was sort of doing this kind of generic like still life in my apartment in Philadelphia. And I just like didn't care what was going on down here. So I moved a mirror to then paint my feet into it. And it's not that I think that this is like a great painting, but for me, what was really important was this idea that you can start off with an idea or a concept or a structure in your painting and you can build it up. But then at some point you have to break that structure and find another equilibrium. And the longer you spend in a painting, I think the more necessary that is. And that's what this, um, that's what this introduction of this mirror sort of did for me. Like I, I'm still working in a very naturalistic way at this time, but that's what that mirror did as a concept for me in my work. Um, fast forward a few years, this is the very beginning of uh, the lockdown and the pandemic. And I think that all of these things that I had been thinking about for a very long time in my practice, something sort of like broke loose during the pandemic. Um, and it, it, oh, it, I finally decided to start, you know, I guess changing, really actively changing the way that I worked when I would go out and still make these plein air paintings and painting from life. And this was one of the first attempts at that. So this is a painting that is actually from a whole bunch of different sources. Um, I painted this from life. I painted this from imagination. I would sometimes use photo references too. Um, but it was it, this acceptance for me that um, actually having this balance of, I think what Rodham said, this idea of something between you know observation and also imagination. There's like a really rich play that exists between those things. And this was sort of an understanding of like, hey, I've, I've got to accept this. It's like a big part of my work. Um, it's a beautiful painting. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I think that it just allows you, it allowed me to, as soon as I sort of gave up the idea of like feeling like I had to depict things in a very specific way or concrete way, it allowed me to understand that I wasn't entirely in control of what was always going on and that there was this element of play and experimentation between me and the work. And that I could put something down with an intention, but then there was also a moment of being like, oh, that's not what it's doing at all. And then stopping and thinking and saying, well, do I want to keep it or do I want to change it? Or how does it change it? Which is different than saying, okay, I'm just going to depict this thing in this very sort of, you know, like a technical way. And instead understanding that there's this element of play and this element of searching that exists in the work. Um, and that's just super important to me. Um, this is a, another piece that I, I did during the lockdown. Um, and it's, you know, it's painted all from life, essentially. It actually started off as a portrait of my friend Noah. Um, and I, I did this little painting, or this, I did this image of Noah. I think it was a really beautiful painting of Noah, actually. Uh, it was, it was, I think it was really, it, I really got his character, and it was great. And he was seated right here. And you can actually see his arm. This is still his arm here from where it started. Um, this is him seated. And then... At some point, I realized that I couldn't make the space work the way I wanted to. So I started taking my easel. I started moving it around in the space. And I was no longer working with him. I was in the same room, but I was taking my easel and just rotating around the room 360 degrees. I would paint whatever, as the light changed, I would paint whatever was exciting to me. And then as soon as I got bored, I would just move the easel and keep working on it. And eventually, I got to this place where I realized I had to paint Noah out. And that was... Uh, a really important moment for me, actually, because painting him in is, was the hook that got me excited about this piece. And then you realize at the end that what I needed to do was to get rid of him. Um, so he was the last thing to go. Um, and this is where the painting ended. Um, 
and then I'll, I'll just show you all one recent painting that I, I've worked on. Um, this one I, I worked on, I think last week or two weeks ago. Um, still, I guess, working in the same mode that I am working in of, of only painting and working on what I feel like I'm, I'm excited about and I want to work on. Um, but I was looking at this painting the other day and I realized that I'm still obsessed with the same type of light I was obsessed with when I was doing this painting. Um, I, I think that I still love this idea of inside light, outside light, um, this idea of how do I find these big relationships organically and playfully and like what do they do in the process and then how do I make a structure or a painting out of that. Um, and that's it. Uh, I will stop awesome. sharing my Thank screen. Thank you. Now. Yeah. Um, awesome. That was a great uh, um, re talk, talk or like presentation. Um, I do want to get into the conversation, uh, but oh. I, I, I want to kind of respond to what Rotem and Gus had both showed in their work, um, presentation or their PowerPoint. Um, I really love that you put Giotto as like kind of the first slide. Um, I feel like we all as painters have been moved by his work at one point or another, and I'm still kind of in the process of understanding him. Like he's so advanced, you know? Um, and I really love that you all kind of brought in work that engage with picture plane and the idea of plasticity in a different way. And if, if there are people here that don't know what plasticity or what Gus said about the plastic image, it's, it's the quality of three, dim, like three dimensional space being translated into a two dimensional surface. So like when we say something feels plastic, it just means that like the space, like the way that you can visually move around the space is almost like you're moving around an actual space, but it's on a two dimensional surface. Um, I really love the way that you talked about the musicality mm -hmm. of Giotto's color placement and space division, how it's like, even though it's like divided into these rectangles and I can also show the screen so you know what I'm talking about. Um, you guys can all see it, right? Um, so like the, the, the top, Oh, the top, I love how the top left and the top right are completely two, di two different colors. Yes, we, yet we understand them as like both being kind of in the backspace. And I, I really can't figure it out. And like the temperature shifts and there are all these nuances that kind of come in to just being considered on such a delicate level. I think it's it's a really fun piece to study. And I don't know if I've seen this work, but I love that you just made them from memory. Um, that's the practice that I ask my students to do often. Um, and I also love, I've also taken a workshop with Ken Cooley and to this day, I, 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 I'm still doing collage. And I think that says a lot about who he is as an artist and teacher. He's impacted a lot of people. Um, and all three of us are kind of sharing that. I feel like sharing that kind of, um, um, impact and influence that he's had on us. Um, and the way that you talked about Brock was also really interesting because you're talking about the way he challenges the familiar and the way the interplay that it has between the objects. He is manipulating form to create almost a secondary visual narrative. And that's more or less kind of similar to what Gus was talking about too, um, about Balthus, who's you know, actually, I ju was just looking at this work this morning, um, how he's able to kind of conceal things, but he does it in such a kind of blatant way. Like, it, it, it's almost, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit, I don't even know. It's kind of, it's kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It, it, it kind of gives me like goosebumps because it's like, oh, that's an interesting way of like making a statement without really saying it. Um, so I kind of wanna like quote Poussin before we get into the, what he said about space. Um, so at the end of his life, Poussin looked back in his career and he said, I have neglected nothing. And I, I, I feel like that's kind of a theme that reappears throughout both of your um, conversation about how these artists engage with space, but more importantly, composition and, and the square, the field of vision that we have on this rectangle. Um, 
And it's interesting how you, you can create so many different ways of approaching this rectangle that change the way you look at life um, and how none of these things are minor. Everything is important, but they all support kind of the culmination of this form into creating this, this really almost electrifying visual experience. Um, so I guess like one thing that kind of uh, pops into my mind, and I think you both kind of talked about it, is kind of the navigation between invention and observation. There's always a conflict that happens when we're looking at something where we're, we have this immediate response and we try to capture that to, the, to some degree into what we create. But at some point, if, you, if you've worked from life enough, it, we have to take ownership and we have to make decisions that are that are responsible for the image itself rather than the thing that exists in front of us. So I'm curious to hear from both of you um, how you navigate that space. Like at what point do you give yourself to what you're looking at? And at what point do you kind of rein it back in and say, these are the decisions I'm gonna make on either my collage, painting, drawing, um, kind of the work that you're creating. But you want to go? I can go first. Or you can go first. Do you want to go first? Um, okay, I can go first. Um, so I think um, should I should I like show a slide while I'm yes. while I'm talking? Right? That'd be helpful. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, okay, so I think you, you stated it really beautifully, Misa, like at what, at what point do we give ourselves like to the painting and, or like, is my heart still at like na looking at nature and, or is my heart in the painting? Um, and it's like, and it's like, we love both of them. <laughs> Uh, very much to and 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 I think what I what like in these past few years when I started working with collage while looking at nature so I think at a at a certain like in a certain sense I'm doing this like I'm taking a step back from nature in the beginning like I'm doing that um that shift <laughs> to invention um, from the very, very beginning, um, like understanding that that um, um, that it's not going to be what's going to be out there, like from like just because my papers that I'm that I have that are pre-painted, and the game is that I don't paint papers as I go. So it's like, so I'm never going to reach like let's say I'm looking at this landscape and there's like a specific green here. I don't have my oil paints or my acrylic paints or, well, I mean, I paint in acrylic, but, but I'm talking now specifically about collage. Like I don't have my palette to mix that certain green. Like I just, don't, so I, so, so I just have it's to work all, from, it's, all pre yeah. it's, it's always pre-mixed. Yeah. So wow. it's, but, and, yeah. and it's, <laughs> and it's pre-mixed without knowing what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do like it's not like yeah. I know my, I, yeah it's it's a lot of unknown uh so like I don't know what landscape I'm gonna do with them I don't know if the papers are gonna um I usually it, like let's say before I came to England I did paint a lot of colors and a lot of greens like as well because I knew in my mind that like England has a lot of greens and then I painted like a, a, a very wide range of greens but I I didn't know how how it's gonna be and and I didn't bring any paint to England just papers so um and um I think when you take that like so understanding, uh, like I, Ken has a sentence that he 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 wrote in, based in in his writings in Notes on Color, that um, that basically when you when you step back from reality and you start inventing at a like at a very early stage, so what comes through is your excitement from nature and like not like you're not trying you're you're from the beginning you're not trying to 
convey like to show what you're seeing but you're you're really showing your excitement and and I love that Gus how you how you talked about just moving the easel to like oh I'm excited now and now I'm like yeah. okay now I'm bored <laughs> and now I'm excited and and like it's so I'm moving I'm just moving in the room and I'm going after my my really my my passion like my my excitement or just like what yeah. what I feel like um doing now and not not like and not after what I'm painting. So I, I'm trusting the painting will kind of, um, will kind of form. Um, and I'm, I'm using really, I'm using what I need from nature and, and, and that's it. Um, like I'm not, yeah, I'm not like, yeah, I'm not like obligated <laughs> too much. Um, yeah. Okay. You are I'll if you, you want to. I'll let right? you, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, that was great. Thank you, Rodham. I mean, yeah, I think going back to the question of like what role these of like observation versus, uh, I guess, invention or abstraction, like how does it all balance out? And I think for me, it's not like there's a, a specific formula I employ. I think of them as different tools in the toolkit that I have. And so I, I generally start working from observation perception because that's how I learned how to paint. Right. Um, and you know, uh, Rotom, I'm glad you brought up the like moving the easel around and painting what's exciting. I think the flip side of that that's really important for me is like moments of extreme boredom or despair are also equally important. <laughs> like I have to have those moments to then have the breakthrough, right? Like I think I'm also sort of a stubborn painter. So I will start off with an idea and I'm like, I'm going to get this and I will work and work and work and work. And at some point I realized that the painting is dead, like the painting has died. Um, I listened to John Dubrow who is another painter I admire a lot. He, he told this story recently about how um, he watched a video of Picasso painting and he started to do this painting and, and Picasso, it got really good. And then all of a sudden he put a mark down and it started to go away. Picasso was like, oh, that's not good. He's like, but it, it could always get, it could always get worse. And he keeps painting and just destroys the painting. And then he has to rebuild it up again. But I think that that is a thing that is a, it's a really hard lesson for young artists to accept, but I think that that's part of the process. And I think that that, the idea of working perceptually or from imagination or abstractly are just different tools I have in my toolkit to help move the painting forward. So if I feel like I'm working from one window and I just feel stuck, like it feels like the painting is not finished and I don't know what to do, I'll literally you know, just move my easel around and I will just start painting something else. Just put something down that will then interact with everything else. And then you will form opinions because you've disrupted whatever structure is there. Um, so I think for me, there's not, it's just, I just know that there's gonna be a sweet balance of all those things at the end of any one given painting. And some paintings might be more observationally based and some of them might be a little more dreamy and invented, but like, I trust that the painting will find its own equilibrium. Yeah, I really like what you said about equilibrium because I feel like painting is always our way of finding harmony amidst all the conflicts that we experience, whether it be like logical versus emotional or even perception versus, you know, um, kind of the experience side. And then you also mentioned something about intuition, Rotem, like intuition is the, or instinct is the only way out of chaos. And I really like that because I think I think that so much about painting, so much of painting is about how we see, how we problem solve, how we navigate, just even the deeper parts of life. And it's actually a really profound thing. It's, it's a meditation, right? Um, so I really love that at the end of the day, in some way, intuition is what we really are cultivating through painting. Um, and there's a quote that I've been talking about a lot. Um, Hans Hoffman talked about this in his uh, Color Creates Light, which is a, it's essentially his teachings um, to all, all these years. And his student um, created kind of a collection of uh, notes and essays on his teaching. And one thing that he said was to have empathy towards the thing that you observe, towards the thing that you're engaging, because you are part of it. Once you're part of it, you have a very different mode of working through your paintings. Um, and I really like that because I think that's, that's exciting. I think that's what we are really excited about. Like, and sometimes we can't really put a finger on why 
why, why do I want to draw a glove that's on the floor? You know, like we don't know. And we would only know as we engage with it in, in such a deep level. Um, I don't really have a question that follows along with the, with this thought, but I just thought it would be really good to talk about because it's a, it's something that is like very personal and intimate. And I think that's why I really was, I was really drawn to both of your work because it's, it's not just about the formal like composition side of things. It's, it's how those compositions express your inner experience of the environment around you. Um, so I guess I have one more question and feel free to start typing in or if you have any question, we can like unmute you and you can feel free to ask those questions. Um, so one more thing, we talked about kind of the limitation quite a bit. Um, and I'm just curious if, if you intentionally impose any rules or limitations upon yourself. I know Rotem, you, you premix and you go out and you like work with um, just painted paper and you're doing collage. Um, but is there anything else that you also intentionally kind of set up yourself so that you, you're forced to navigate or come up with a solution? And also for you, Gus, so something to think about. Yeah, um, Rotom, I thought that was great what you said about limitations and finding a way to work around them. I, I think that's super important. Um, I employ a lot of those things all the time, and it just sort of depends what I want to do. Recently, I've just been painting with my left hand, right? Like, I'll start paintings with my left hand. I'm right-handed, and so it's just, you know, it's it's a clumsy, awkward thing, but you realize every mark is alive because you don't kind of know where it's going to go. <laughs> um, and I then realized that as I build up more and more chaos, I then got to go, I got to switch to my right hand. I need a little control. Um, that, that's when I do, I'll paint with a straight edge, I'll paint with my finger, you know, just like anything that feels like it's engaging in a way that is activating and exciting. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I talked about it a bit um, after my um, the story I said about Ken in Italy that he had so he had the formats like the same format already um, like cut. It was, I think, 12 by 12. And then I realized that um, that repetition, um, just having the same like it. So if I'm so usually in terms, okay, should I, maybe I'll show my, um, my screen. Um, um, so, um, so, okay, I can show these, let's say. Um, so I was here, I'm in front of a still life and, um, and I, I, in the end, I ended up doing three variations after this still life. And it was a really simple, like really simple composition. But like when I, so what happens to me, like when I, I, I work a lot with repetition and, and variations and it, and I think like that the limitation of the size, like I say, okay, basically this is, it's, I did it the first time and, and there's something there that's still like that's still very mysterious like there's something there that that that's still interesting um and 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 so I approach it again um but I'm with the same basically I'm, I'm with the same size usually so that's like so so I'm kind of comfortable with the with the with with the square with like the proportions and I I, I know I'm familiar also with what I'm looking at and then I'm, so I'm switching the color combination and, and the color, like a new color combination um, builds like a new world um, and a new, a new sense of time, a new sense of light, a different time of day. And basically I'm using like, um, yeah, so it's like there, there, so, so I'm using like those limitations in terms of like what I'm looking at and this and the format um but like I'm changing I'm changing the color combination and and then basically I'm I'm in a new place it it, it really is like a new a whole new place um and uh, yeah so that's 
limitation is 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 uh is a very <laughs> it's a very important um element i think for for me um we were because oh sorry. yeah oh yeah just it's, I'm just um, curious if you rework the same painting or collage over and over because you kind of mentioned what Ken does, which is like creating different compositions of the same thing and just working on the same thing over and over, but creating different kind of iterations of it. Like, mm -hmm. do you do that a lot as well? And how does how did that change your work? Like, as you get to like I don't know the fifth of this composition of the same thing or fifth image of the same motif yeah um so should i share my screen again <laughs> uh, it's up to you whatever okay better. yeah um i feel it's just nice to to look at something visual and not uh only sure. um but okay so i'll um <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys and then like we can open the floor up after this so that everybody gets a chance okay um okay yeah, I guess I mean I, I feel we're we're almost up to like we're 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 close to QA. So I'll I'll share it in just a bit. So I'll just answer like this. Um so you asked like how okay, so I I I don't really work on a few things at once. Oh, um okay. yeah, that's I'm I'm uh I I always I uh I always work just on one painting. Uh, each time and uh, and I it I finish it like and I, I have to feel that I'm that it's uh, yeah that it's it's whole I guess that it's uh, that it has its own <laughs> really yes uh, I don't know how you do that I'm so yeah I don't know that either <laughs> okay yeah um uh, it it has to have like because I feel that it's kind of like when I start a painting so it's like I it it's like living and it has like its own blood circulation and like until the blood circulation doesn't kind of run without me um I don't I I can't leave like I can't leave it I can't go I can't just go to something else like I have to um I have to continue to yeah I and of course, there there is a few paintings that that I don't um, like. Of course, sometimes there's a painting that just doesn't work, and then it gets put like I I put it aside, and I usually feel um, that I'm gonna throw it away or that it, it's probably not gonna ever happen, and then I can come to it again after like a few months and just and and work on it again. Um, and those are and that happens as well, but like. Um, in the end, I didn't answer the question, but <laughs> oh, it's interesting. I just I, I um, don't relate, but it, that's wonderful that I don't relate because it's like your work's yeah, so me different from me. I I work on I don't know how many paintings I work on at once, so I don't you know it takes a long time to finish them because I you know start like five paintings at once. But mm -hmm. I think what that does, I can I can I can anticipate what that does is that it kind of forces you to really resolve the painting right then and there and be present with it instead of like having because habits do show up in our paintings right like when we right. work five paintings at once the habits are just everywhere <laughs> and instead of like being able to really work through some things we're just kind of spreading the decisions same the similar decisions across um well it has yeah pros and cons mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I think it has to do with like um, with really like um, it has to do with really uh, having each painting be a very very specific experience. Like uh, like ha I, like I always have a very specific question that I'm that I'm asking, and it's like a question I've never asked before in any in like any other painting. Like it's it's usually um, it, it's it's like a, a painting question or or an abstract question. Um, but it it's like what is this compared like to this, and then this <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it it's like it's something you know it's something abstract, but it's uh, very like I have to. But it's 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 um I've never asked that question um so 
so it's like it's kind of a, like a quest to to resolve yeah. how yeah like yeah no that's a really good way of... I've never really talked about that actually so oh. that's interesting. <laughs> great that's yeah. the goal of the artist <laughs> um so I'm going to turn this over to the crowd I think Marissa you wanted to say something so I'm just gonna unmute you Oh, thank you, Nisa. Yep. Um, hi, guys. It's good to see you hey, here. <laughs> it's been a long time. I've been following and uh, Rotom. I think this is the first time we get to meet you on this level. Um, I've been just admiring your work from afar and through Ken. And um, you just touched on so many paralleling good things here in these talks today. Uh, there's so much I could say, but I'll try to keep it short and brief. Um, I just wanted to touch on, uh, I think it was the Titian painting, Gus. And I know you said like, you made a remark about like, you know, what you weren't sure of what it was and what I, my immediate response or reaction to it is that it defies gravity and everything just is held so wonderfully by everything else in the painting. Even his yeah. figure feels like it's defying gravity in the space. Um, I love that. Yeah. And then um, wrote, um, I was coming back to the word and I've been sitting with it here for a little bit invention. And invention, I had to look it up too. I always look up words just to make sure I'm kind of recalling or maybe understanding a new meaning to the definition, but to create something that hasn't existed before. And I'm recalling Ken's workshop this past spring. And he had us mix and paint colors or invent them before we went into work by collage. And I somehow wonder like, this inventing color, does it, is it something that ha that comes from nowhere or does it come from somewhere from within you that you're recalling or if somehow it comes out and you're mixing together these colors and like it comes together in a way that it, it just clicks and something excites you in that moment and you know that's your color, you know, like I'm just wondering about it and you don't have to give like a direct answer. It's just kind of food for thought, I think for myself and just a reflection of what you talked about here. And gosh, you're kind of doing this dance. I think you talked about between thinking and playing. Um, and I'm just thinking back to what Ken kept kind of subtly nudging or repeating in his class was just to not think. So kudos to you guys. Good talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thanks so much. And if you want to, you, you know, answer a remark on any of those things, I would love to hear any responses you have to give. Thanks, Marissa. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marissa. It's good to uh, hear your voice. Um, yeah, I think that the uh, relationship between, I guess, like thinking and playing is, I think that's a really great way to think about it because I think playing is inherently like, it's not anti-thinking at all, but it's some form of, of thinking that's sort of more, I guess it's more instinctual to go back to what uh, Rodham was talking about. And I just think that that's like a really important thing in painting um, to sort of may not understand what it was that's driving you to do something in the moment, but trusting that your instincts are going to take you to the next level and that it's going to move the painting forward, whatever it is. Um, I, I forget what it was. I think Richard Diebenkorn in his notes to himself had something about like, you know, there is no mistake. Like there's no, you can't put something down and I'm paraphrasing, but like you can't put something down and then erase it, right? Like there's no, it's not like you put it down and erase it and then you're back to where you were. You can put something down and try to take it out, but it's then moved forward. It's like, it's, it's no longer the thing it was a second ago. And I think just that as an acceptance, right? And this idea that every time I try something, I sort of accept the fact that it's going to fail. Like everything I'm trying to do is going to fail. But what I hopefully can do is sort of fail in harmony or fail in an interesting way, right? Where it's like, I'm trying to arrive at this other thing, but I actually arrive over here and having enough good instincts to say, okay, well, okay, I guess that's where I landed and just stopping in the right moment. I just want to note something real quick because I, I really love what you said about playing not being anti-thinking. And when we observe children playing, they don't play to succeed. You know, they don't play to win. They play to discover, right? They play. Yeah. And what ends up happening usually it's they break their own rules. They start with rules and they're yeah. like, oh, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this. <laughs> I really love that flexibility to be able totally. to, to allow yourself to break your own rules but you're not breaking it because it's 
easy to break them. It's just because right. it's necessary. So it's that that element of play being motivated by necessity. And it's necessary to move the image along because you're you're prioritizing the painting or the image that you're engaging with. And I really love that. I I, I really think that's a really important trait to have to to really be in this for the long haul because <laughs> yeah, you said you said that beautifully Misa you did you said that so yeah. well I mean it, it reminds me of just my one of my favorite moments in a painting is and realizing what you just said is that idea of having a limitation that you utilize to help move the painting forward and then realizing that you have to abandon that limitation yeah. right that actually the painting is saying hey, you were painting with your left hand or you were painting with a straight edge or you were painting with these specific colors. Now you've got to break out of that because the painting actually requires you to do something else and knowing and trusting your instincts. And it's not because you're not breaking the rules because you're lazy or because you don't want to follow the rules. It's because you've reached the limitations of what that limitation is and you have to like find a new game to play, I guess. Right, it's, it's not working for you. It's not working for the painting and you have to now evolve with it. And I think that's why it's so meditative because you are also growing with your painting, whether you yeah. realize it or not. And I think that's a beautiful place to be, but it's often difficult because we want to hold on to what's familiar. Yeah. But yeah, we get that, precious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the hard thing. It, it requires a lot of courage to be yeah. able to break it and, and to invent, kind of like Rotom is talking about invention. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about your color choices as Marissa has asked about your, how do you yeah. invent those colors or like, is it out of invention? Like what you're just kind of trying to mix different colors that look beautiful to you or you're probably observing from um, taking colors from life. So Marissa, are you, did you talk about um, the, like the, the mixing or the combinations like the combinations of colors in the collages because it's like for me it's it's like two separate um it, it's like two separate things really um yeah and to me it sound it seemed like and it sounded like to me like when uh -huh. you approach to collage is that you have these pre-mixed colors but then you're responding in a sense to what's available and bringing it and integrating it together kind of in an, or in an organic sense so, but somehow organizing it in a way is that accurate um yeah so um so one second um <laughs> it's just my father is calling me oh, oh. Um, and I kind of hear it on the phone um sorry Hi, um <laughs> yeah bye so um <laughs> sorry about that um yeah so what happens um I I, I think so this is this is actually um, like what you're talking about is um, like the, the specific color combinations. It's like, I think that was um, a really big moment for me when like I, um, I was standing in front of nature and I realized that, okay, if I have these premixed colors and, and I don't have like, I don't have a way of, of really, arriving at the colors I see so like so my my color combination has to has to really the only thing it can really show because I'm experiencing nature is like my excitement at this moment so like so what I think when I'm doing the color combinations like so is is not really it's it's more feeling what I like feeling what I what I have what I see in front of me and then kind of choosing this is another limitation that I limit myself um to to like minimum amount of colors really like four or five colors and then that can I, that can turn into like six seven or eight but like the the minimum is like I start with three and then or four and then try to um try to 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 really give the sense of of, of reality or what I'm seeing in front of me because I really never work from photos um it's just not I, I I love how like Gus said like I can move um reality is just is just so mysterious and so wonderful so like I I love I love having that just like the feeling that everything is alive like the the papers 
the landscape like everything is moving <laughs> absolutely um, it's one one moving beast so to speak but a lovely one and um what i was kind of want to come back to before you like whenever you premix the colors is that kind of like a response and an ex you know responding to the excitement within yourself whenever you mix to find a color do you kind of arrive at it with the same type of like revelation of excitement when you see that color experience it firsthand yeah yeah it's like it's a very sensual experience for me um and yeah i actually i have uh i even brought a <laughs> um i have um yeah i have uh oh wait um do you see my screen not yet okay oh okay um no okay um i'll try one more time and then <laughs> okay i don't know it's not um so <laughs> um anyway i had i have a, a a photo of um of just like the papers i might be um, able to pull that up but yeah okay so up. what i so i so um marissa so what i when i paint the papers it's like i i really think of tasting them um yeah that that the one with the yellow <laughs> um so i i really feel like um I, I I kind of uh, have have the because I'm only painting. Oh, so it's the next one, um, Misa. Uh, the what? next one after that. The next one, I think. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what? this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, and yeah, the, these these like sometimes I just take take photos, just like looking at the papers, <laughs> um, can also just excite me. Just um, just seeing them together not even compose um so so when i when i paint them it's um i i always like my rule is like okay i'm gonna mix a color that i've never mixed <laughs> hmm. um and uh and i'm gonna and this is like another thing actually ken talked about is that like we usually have a tendency to make the scale a bit like um, to, to kind of narrow the scale. And then like, if if we constantly try to like, to, um, to, to find a color because um, yeah, like to find a color that's outside of the scale, that's like an alien <laughs> to, because, because yeah, there's, so there's like the colors that kind of, that come out of each other that we're like mixing that I'm kind of using the brush and mixing more colors out of the prior colors and then they become kind of family of colors but then like there's new colors that that I that are totally out of like a, a different color scheme or a different just and then to to and then to kind of I think it's a very interesting like when when two color like I think J Japanese prints like they do that a lot like they kind of bring in they, they kind of have there's like all these grays and like beautiful greens and things that are kind of in one family and then they put this like pink or this like red that's in just like a totally different um scale of like saturation of tone of temperature like of everything it's just it's a, just a kind of like a joker um so they kind of they they play with it a lot yeah you can stop sharing um the screen oh actually you know what I there is oh, oh sorry um there's another thing that's that I wanted to say um that's also very exciting is that because I paint the, the papers in two layers so I never can know um what the, what like the because it's like kind of chemistry like so I can never know what the how the second layer you see like how here let's yeah, say how some pink coming yeah through. like right like so you can never like foresee that you can never yeah. really I can never know how this pink will look on top of this um like here it's um yeah I don't even know what was under this pink I think like <laughs> some kind of blue or something I don't know but 
it's yeah. it's never predictable so I am always yeah it's very surprising <laughs> I, I actually have one question from the audience I know we're cutting a little close to the time but um Katie Arnold asked when you pin your paper are you pinning onto another piece of paper because um I think your process is also you know there's a slide where there's like these little pins uh -huh. that you would you know yeah so so I use um foam board and oh, okay. um and then the foam board is basically uh reusable because uh after when I glue the the collage so the collage kind of glues itself like to one to it to itself oh, I see. and then and then it becomes kind of like a quilt and and you kind of peel it off the foam board uh and then you can use the, the so then uh, I was talking about the variations where I work again and again. So I usually use the same foam board for, for many variations. So it's like in the end, it's all, it's all very, uh, with many. Do you, do you start off with one big piece of paper that you then are gluing the smaller pieces onto that you take off of the foam board or, or uh, you just doing no. the small pieces? Um, so I start usually with the big pieces um, and I like cover the foam board really really quickly um and uh and it it usually because I don't arrive like I I usually don't arrive at the color combination very like I mean sometimes I arrive at it fast but sometimes I'm checking like I I put like four or five colors and then and then I switch and then I switch again and then I switch again like until um until like I until there's really a feeling of um of, of a place mm. um and um and Gus it's it's wonderful you talked about um the, the inside and outside because um like how you're so interested in in um in the window and the interior because I'm really like I'm I'm now doing like this series and then I have like another series that I'm working on of like a figure in a room with um with a window um so it's like so I'm just it's it's um it's such a it's such an interesting subject um and I think what really interests me there is um is um yeah just like the fact that it's like a reality inside a reality um Misa, yeah. it's what I what I wrote in the like on Instagram um yeah the about the Matisse being interior yep. and exterior and the reality yeah. the worlds present yeah yeah it's like a world inside a world inside a world and then like yeah it's it's um I just it's it's um it's fun <laughs> I I have I one too. comment from Kay Kathy um I don't know how to read her last name but um she said thank you for providing this interview today I enjoyed the processes presented I have been a student of Gus's and always enjoy his excitement and how he presents his knowledge and new approaches. I love the idea of moving his easel while painting um, to new perspectives. Rodem was so interesting with her paintings and collages, something new to try for me. This interview with the artist gave me such inspiration to play and try new things. Thank you all again. So. Hi, Kathy. Thank you for coming. It was great having you in class. So Thank it's you. 1230. I, it ran a little um, long, um, but if you have any more questions, you can always, I'm just giving permission on behalf of the artist, but you can, uh, they're, they're active on Instagram. They're also active showing work. Um, so, you know, feel free to reach out to them and like connect with them. It's, it's really been an honor to even do this talk again. I've kind of put interviews on hold for a year because I started teaching college and it got really exhausting <laughs> and overwhelming. But I feel like this is a really good kickstart to kind of the more conversations that we share. So um, just wanna say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Rodam and Gus for just your sincerity and vulnerability too, and like sharing your process and who you are as an artist. Um, so yeah. Um, do you guys have any, I think Rodem, you have a show coming up. Yeah. Um, in, um, in Kings Oaks in, um, oh, great. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So I'm going to be That's part awesome. of a, a group show. Um, Clara, uh, Weishan and, and Alex Cohen, they, um, they're gonna, um, they basically turn their barn into a museum. Um, 
it and they bring painters like from all over the world and uh it's really like if you have it's it's really a, a spectacular um like vision in itself and uh it's just so so beautiful like such a beautiful place um and they have a beautiful garden there and um and they have really really like good i don't know just like uh, the way they 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 see painting is just um it, it's a real it's a really an experience so if you have a chance um they'll probably start um um advertising soon uh, right. and the show opens i think september um 12th or 15th or like somewhere in September so and it's gonna run until October 10th so awesome so if you're in the area or if you're looking for something to do <laughs> right and I'll be I'll be there um for the whole month so wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna help them with the show and I'm gonna I'm, I'm yeah I'm planning to paint and um to see friends and everything so yeah all righty well thank you everybody Thanks guys. And we'll Thank definitely you. be in touch and um, yeah, stay tuned for the next exhibition. This, um, this exhibition is on view until July 15th. So just go ahead and like check out the show and say hi. And then we can, yeah, we can just like put up the next show, but I'm just really happy to have done this. So thanks everyone. Yeah. Misa, you, Misa, you, you, you so much. Thank you so much. You really, yeah. it, it you. was such an honor and a pleasure. To Thank you. you. All right. Yeah. Well, great to be part of this. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Really good to meet you guys. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>